Time now for sports on 104.7 The Cave. Here's Ned Reynolds. Mike, the intern, Ned Reynolds in the studio on a wet Tuesday morning. So yesterday during the press conference, Coach Andy Reid uh, basically talked about having to let some players go. The first cut for some of the uh, players for the Chiefs were made yesterday. Kind of give the... uh, listener a rundown on how that works usually the uh, the w- protocol in the nfl for all teams is they have to be at 85 players today at three o'clock that's three o'clock central time for that varies across the country for eastern of course Chiefs have two more players to go they sliced some players yesterday but they also added one danny shelton so they still have two players to go to get to the 85 number then this time next week they have to be at 80 the following week They have to be down to about 75, somewhere in that vicinity. And then the following Thursday, which would be August the 30th, then they have to have the roster at 53. So the massive cut comes after the uh, final exhibition game. It's a a tough way to go. It's a tough profession to follow. But after all, that's part of the business. That's what does happen. And, uh, you know, these guys will pop up somewhere else. They might be in need across the league for them, or they might go to a development league. They might go to Canada. They might play in the XFL still a thing? They uh, <laughs> probably not now. I can't say definitely not now in Canada because they're three-quarters of the way through their season up there now. And uh, they're they're playing pretty well. That's the Canadian Football League's been drawing some large crowds. In terms of developmental Taxi squads, yes. That would be for some of the proven players and maybe some of the younger ones. Chiefs yesterday sliced Lonnie Johnson, who they got from the Houston Texans. He was supposed to be depth at defensive back, wasn't getting the job done. He's probably out for uh, from any other team. That, But that's a guess. Anything can happen. These guys keep themselves in shape, and they are ready to go at any beck and call. You know, it's not only the American golfers the uh, live tour is after. Could be after some of the guys overseas, like the British Open champion is one of them. You think he's going to the Live Tour? Yeah, I'm afraid he is. Yeah, this is Cameron Smith, who you're talking about, and he did win the British Open this year. He's he's actually an Aussie, but he's been playing on the PGA Tour and winning. Well, he <laughs> he ran into a bit of a tough time at the last tournament, the one in St. Jude. He was given a two-stroke penalty when he was closing in on the lead. Well, that really is immaterial. Handle it like a gentleman took the penalty. But after the tournament was over, he said, I'm not playing next week in the BMW Classic, which is starting Thursday in 48 hours. I'm going to withdraw from that, and I think the withdrawal is because he's going to go to the live tour. He had hinted at such. Whether or not this is a good move, I don't know. The PGA is countering by not only suspending the players, they're sending in the howitzers now, the big battleship guns that are going to... Tiger Woods is going to talk to the player. Yeah, <laughs> well, God, can you imagine you get a knock at the door from that guy? He'd probably just be like, all right, give me some of your money, and then uh, we'll talk. All right, last but not least, uh, college football rankings are out, and we are getting close to the start of the season, my man. The Associated Press rankings, and that's considered the the uh, old Rosetta Stone, so to speak, of all the college football rankings, and it isn't really changed from any of the others. Alabama is number one, Ohio State two, Georgia, Clemson, and Notre Dame. They all make up the top five. Then you go to the second grouping of five, and it's also an elite team. Now, Mike, that will change after the first week. And the reason that I'm really positive that it'll change is because two of those teams are playing each other. Ohio State is playing Notre Dame in the opener in Columbus, Ohio. I think there'll be a few people there to see that. Man, I'd like to be there, to be honest with you, and I don't care about either team, to be honest with you. Ohio Stadium, which is one of the the great uh, venues in in all of sports, seats about 106,000. That's the big horseshoe in Columbus. They'll have that and more when you consider the allotment to Notre Dame. Notre Dame travels great. They're the universal, or were anyway, the universal Roman Catholic team. So this will be a great matchup, Ohio State-Notre Dame. Ohio State will go in as the favorite team, but don't sell the Irish short. They're pretty good. College basketball coach passed away yesterday, left a mark on the game. What do you remember about him? He was one of the most brilliant minds in college basketball, very much an older version of the late Charlie Spoonhour. This is Pete Carrill from Princeton who we're talking about. Carrill was, he died yesterday at 92 brilliant basketball mind and a guy who had a specific strategy in basketball that won but he knew he had to do it with specific athletes took over at princeton in the 1967 
when Butch Van Breedekoff stepped down after the Bill Bradley era at Princeton. Now keep in mind, gang, those of you who are not familiar with Princeton University, it is one of the most elite academic universities in the world, and not just in this country. It's very small, has maybe oh, 6,500, 7,000 students in East Central New Jersey. And athletically, you don't get some of the big athletes who are going to the Arkansas and the UCLA. You don't, you don't get them. And Kirill knew this when he took over. He said, but I am getting smart kids, and they'll listen to the style of basketball. And that style, Mike, was absolutely sensational. He won 13 Ivy League titles. They were in the NCAA tournament 17 times, and they did it with a specific style of basketball, backpicking, backpicking and screening. And <laughs> invariably, when you played Princeton, you looked around, all of a sudden there's somebody getting a layup underneath because the defender's been picked right out of the way without even knowing it. It was brilliant. The one that I remember most of all was early March of 1989, NCAA National Tournament first round. Georgetown, number one team in America, playing Princeton, number 16 team in the seedings. 16 had never beaten number one. Games in Providence, Rhode Island, I'll not forget it. Here is, I turned it, it's a blowout. Heck, uh, here's Georgetown, probably. Alonzo Mourning is uh, one of the great remember, stars. Oh, yeah. Dikembe Mutombo. Yeah, I remember that you know team. You who Dikembe Mutombo Oh, is? yeah, dude, I remember that Georgetown team. That was right when I was super into basketball, and that was like the, as far as college team goes, that was the college team that you they, really wanted to root for. John Thompson was a good. Dikembe Mutombo, folks, is the guy in the commercials that runs around, no, 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 and swats mm-hmm. away. The guy was a, a beast. Anyway, uh, 1989, playing up in Providence, Rhode Island, I turned it on midway through. Georgetown's a 28-point favorite. They're losing at halftime, 29-21. to 21. That's how Princeton made you play. Low-scoring games, control the ball, get the good shots. Yeah, it was a 45-second shot clock. That's true. They worked it to perfection. I said, my God, we're about to have the first 16 beating number one ever. It didn't happen. Down the stretch, Georgetown used their talent, got up. And in the closing seconds of the game, Georgetown led 50 to 49. Princeton had the ball. Princeton drove their top scorer into the corner, took a jump shot, and Alonzo Morning sent it three rows up into the stands. All right, had one second left. Threw it into the same guy from out of bounds. Took a long jump shot, three pointer. Ended up three rows in the stands. Alonzo Morning went up and blocked it again. I mean, my goodness sake, that was the sheer talent. Other than that, they were beaten by a, a Princeton team that was good, but hardly in the same category they were athletically. You can do it with your head. Charlie Spoonhour did it down here. Pete Carrill did it at Princeton in the Hall of Fame. Brilliant coach, 514 career victories in college. That's, that's a tough one. That's a tough loss, but a great, great coach. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, kind of a tough blow for the Dodgers now. We, at least it doesn't have anything to do with ringworm. <laughs> Isn't that, of all things, what on earth is Fernando to do? Does he think we're idiots? Ringworm. ringworm. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. Uh, I'm sorry. I kid, I kid, I kid. Anyway, this is Walker Bueller about whom we're talking. Walker Bueller is one of the Dodgers' better pitchers, but keep in mind, he hasn't pitched for two months. He's been out because of an elbow problem. He's going to have to have elbow surgery, so he's out until next year. Does that hurt the Dodgers? Well, probably not to the extent that you'd think because he hasn't really been a part of this winning team. Heck, they're the winningest team in baseball, and they're right up there ready to challenge for a World Series. They've done it without him. They would do it with him, of course, but uh, his loss for the rest of the year is probably not going to be quite as impacting as if it were to have happened right now. Last but not least, what's the schedule tonight for the Missouri baseball team? Well, they're all back in action. Last night was an idle night. Cardinals play the Colorado Rockies, first of a three-game series at Bush Stadium. Hey, this should be a sweep for St. Louis. Yeah, I know it wasn't out in Denver, but say. playing out in Colorado is a different story. Yes, sir. I think St. Louis has three big wins coming up here. Kansas City Royals, who've been playing dynamite baseball, folks, They're really coming into their own. They're going to Target Field in Minneapolis, play the Minnesota Twins, and really do the Twins some harm in the American League Central Division. And the Springfield Cardinals are home. They're taking on the Arkansas Travelers out of North Little Rock, Arkansas. Six-game series beginning tonight. 
and lasting right through the week. Pretty good series coming up. Springfield has to win to maintain any kind of playoff hopes at all. Maybe they will. They're playing better as well. Uh, and I got word yesterday that uh, Flaherty is going to do a rehab start tonight. Is He'll that probably, right? probably throw about 45 or 50 pitches tonight, weather permitting. Yeah, Flaherty is down here. Uh, how close he is to returning to the Cardinals, probably not immediately. But at least we'll see how he can pitch against competition. This is the second time down here now in, in rehab. And... Uh, I think it's indicative of where the Cardinals need or what they need more than anything else down the stretch run. They want him back, but they all, they don't want damaged goods back, of no. course. So we'll see how he makes out down here. Should be very interesting. I hope they uh, give him the time he needs because I really believe, at least right now, like you mentioned with the Dodgers, they've won the Cardinals, being who I'm talking about, have won without Flaherty, which has been great. Um, but to get him back the end of August, early September, when we really get close, will be a huge get for, for the Cardinals. Don't rush it, guys, is what I'm saying. Don't rush it. We need him in the postseason. Need him for the playoffs. Yeah, big time. Ned, we need you for the playoffs, too, and I'll see you tomorrow.